welcome back to Redmond Reviews. I'm Chris Garlock, and of course, joined once again by Michael Redmond himself. Hey, Michael. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you back, and uh, thanks for your patience, folks. Uh, we've been up to, uh, well, actually, Michael, you have been teaching a pretty exciting class. I wanted to hear a little bit about that before we dive into our new series. Yeah, I'm about halfway into my classes in Chiba University, mm -hmm. um, and I'm teaching them how to play Go, so it's a beginner's class. Um, it's really amazing how smart university students are because they're much quicker to pick up. I'm more used to teaching um, middle-aged to old people, so it's, uh -huh. it's, a, it's refreshing to be teaching young people who are so quick. It's a big class, too, I think you said. It's a huge class. Like I think it took everyone by surprise. Um, <laughs> We started out with about 160 uh, students, and I think a few have uh, dropped out, so maybe something more like 150 now. Wow, that's amazing. And they had to stop allowing people to sign up for it because they were going to pass 200, and that was like the limit for um, <laughs> the, the biggest room that they could get ready. Yeah, well, so, I, yeah. I don't think any of your fans here are the slightest bit surprised by this, Michael. So. I think actually all this AI stuff did a uh, actually made people interested because they do have some they have a section where they're studying stuff like computer programming all, in mm. that school also yeah so that yeah. could be part of it. Speaking of which, that's what our new series is going to be. Uh, obviously, we're going to be looking at the AlphaGo versus AlphaGo game. So. Yes. Uh, and I know you've been studying them intensely, and we've uh, talked a little bit uh, over the last few weeks. So. Why don't you sort of set the stage uh, with sort of your general thoughts before we dive into this first game? Sure. Well, I um, I started looking at these games with expectations that maybe I would be seeing some new Joseki. Okay. Um, something new in the opening. I was really interesting to see if it would uh, drift away from the human bias in the first few moves of the game because it's still playing star points and three, four points. So that was something I was looking for. Um, Apart from that, like um, in the Master series, Master AlphaGo would be taking a lead early in the game, and then it would be simplifying the game after that. Mm. So I, and that's something that uh, top human players do too. So it was a very human tactic or, or strategy to simplify the game when it was gonna when it knew it was gonna win. Okay. Um, so I was wondering if I'd be seeing stuff like that, and that was a place where I was surprised because actually in these games the games are very very complicated and they get yes. more exciting as the game goes on. So that was something that took me surprised. Uh, of course, I was um, really interested in what I was calling mistakes in the end game, mm -hmm. um, yeah, in the master series. And I was gonna, and uh, AlphaGo still does that to a certain extent, but uh, the end games also are much more difficult to pick apart. And so it's a lot more work to try to find mistakes. And I think the mistakes, if there are any mistakes that change the, the margin, they're probably coming much more early in the game at a point where it's almost impossible for me to find them. Well, this is really, really exciting stuff, and I know folks have been talking about this, so uh, I know we're all excited to, uh, to jump into this new series. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this uh, first AlphaGo, AlphaGo game. Yes, well, um, I was going to say, actually, I was a bit disappointed in the realm of Joseki because it's not coming up with any more complicated Josekis. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually um, limited the number of Joseki it plays, so it's simplifying the first, the very first parts of the game. Mm -hmm. um, but it um, it makes up by that by complicating the game in the middle game. <laughs> well, and this... so, uh, yeah. No, this this one uh, just just to warn you guys out there, this one gets. It gets complicated, and, and uh, it gets even more complicated. But luckily, we have you to guide us through here, so thank you. Well, yeah, it takes a lot of time for me to work through these games. It's a lot of work, but of course, I'm hoping that, um, I'm hoping that I'll be uh, learning from the experience, too, all the work I'm putting into it. Um, so now White plays a Kakari against the star point. Um, right. Uh, AlphaGo almost never plays a pincer against this Kakari. Like, the most hmm. common human move would be uh, to play a pincer now for black. Sure. Um, like, the, let's see, I, I have a variation here, yeah. Like, black could play, this is the most common move, maybe, and actually there's this variation here, which has become, um, or at least before AlphaGo, it was like 
um, a very popular variation in which um, black is playing aggressively. Black does have the pincer on the right side. And white is going to be moving out with both of these groups and is going to be developing into this big fight. There's a lot of complications that are going to start in the upper side. Mm -hmm. and, and this fight is just going to sort of spread out into the center of the board. So this is something that all of the professional community has been doing a lot. I think this, um, this sort of new Joseki, you might say, uh, um, has become... It started out in China, I think, but it's, it's become one of the major Joseki variations uh, and people have been studying it for, I guess, a year or so. I'm not really sure about that number, but um, <clears throat> but that's the kind of thing you're, you're seeing. This pincer is the most popular move in human games, and then maybe this is about the same. So, um, but AlphaGo never plays the pincer. I, I haven't hmm. seen AlphaGo play the pincers, and I think just in the the first few moves in the corner, I think AlphaGo likes to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. And also, AlphaGo still has a tendency to like to make a living group. It, 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 uh, its idea of thickness and weakness, um, strength of a group, is very uh, is um, actually more strict than most pros. It's, it reminds me of Chochkun actually, mm -hmm. um, because uh, like um, you remember, Chochkun was famous to, for taking territory in the beginning of the game. Of course. And um, people would say he loves territory, and he would refute that by saying that he was just making a living group. And the opponent's wall is the weak group, and um, <laughs> and he had logic that um, he his his own um, reasons uh, for why he thought that was true. So okay. it, that's very simple, similar with AlphaGo. Like AlphaGo will play um, quickly to make a living group mm -hmm. and just settle that group, especially when AlphaGo is playing inside the opponent's territory. Like in in this. Uh, position, you would sort of expect white to be playing something like this, maybe on the lower side. Um, but uh, AlphaGo doesn't really like this Kakari very much. It played it once, I think, in the in a similar position in the 50 games. So we'll mm -hmm. be seeing this once if we go through all of the 50 games. Um, but this Joseki here, it takes some time actually for white to make a living shape, and um, and black gets the pincer which is also an extension on the right side. So this is a nice shape for black. And white is not 100% alive yet on the lower side. Right. So I think this is the kind of thing that AlphaGo is uh, trying to avoid. And um, let's see. Otherwise, um, this is the game move. <laughs> so we're, it's getting excited or exciting already. Um, another move that would be typical of humans would be to extend here, I think just to make a solid shape on the right side. So this is, this would be actually very feasible, white making a living group on the right side. And by doing so, it's reducing black's potential on the lower side. Okay. So this is a very uh, pacific way of playing. This looks actually very aggressive or dangerous. Um, um, I, I had yeah. a question here. Now, when I was reviewing the commentary, preparing for this, I mean, what when you saw this move, what was your first thought? I mean... Well, not this move, actually the move after that. Okay. Um, I think I was, I, if I was looking at a human game, I would get the impression that White was just playing around and right. fooling around with the game. Right. <laughs> um, this move is really unusual, um, but my interpretation of what actually AlphaGo is trying to do is that AlphaGo is going into an area where Black has more strength, Black has more stones on the lower side. Um, AlphaGo wants to either make a living shape as fast as possible or just to avoid fighting within Black's sphere of influence. So okay. in this case, white is trying to curl around to the right side. Let's see if I have a variation in. Oh, I have this one. Um, like if black plays here, oh, that's the game move. If black plays here, um, white has the option to do something like this mm. and um, just give the lower side to black and make a right. position on the right side. So this is basically what white is trying to do. And I put an A and a B on the, uh, yeah, you can see that, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's as if Black started out with a 3-4 point at A, and White played a Kakari at B. Okay. And so this way White's um, being able to switch away to the right side. Now locally, the position in the lower right corner is supposed to be a bit bad for White, locally, but of course the direction of play is good. So um, escaping from Black's area of um, strength at the same time as reducing its potential out into the center is one of the goals that AlphaGo has here. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and uh, let's, okay, this is the next move. Um, just going back a bit, um, if black plays here, uh, mm -hmm. this is a point where a human player would be tempted to push on the fourth line to make a kind of a Nadar ishik. But I, um, and this is actually feasible, but I sort of doubt that, like, this would, if black plays here, this would be the Nadar, the Avalanche Joseki. Sure. Um, AlphaGo actually has a very bad record with the Avalanche Joseki. Like, hmm. um, when it was playing Fang Hui, I think there were about two games where it played the large Avalanche Joseki with Fang Hui um, of the five games that they've published. And both times, AlphaGo made a mistake in that, in the variation. Mm -hmm. And Fang Hui had an advantage at that point in the game. Um, or at least seemed to have an end. And then there was a game in the 60 Masters, 60 game Master Series, in which um, AlphaGo sort of stumbled into the, the Avalanche Joseki right. and played a new move. <clears throat> and I was really excited because it was a new move, mm -hmm. but it turned out that it was just a mistake. Right. <laughs> well, not really, but it was a bad position for AlphaGo. Right. Um, so I, I, if I was AlphaGo, I would have a phobia about the uh, Avalanche Joseki now. And I actually haven't seen AlphaGo playing it. So um, I sort of expect AlphaGo just to play here, just to get some extra space on right. the lower side. Keep it and, simple. Yeah, keep it simple. And actually, if, if White plays towards the second line now, uh, White's going to have a fairly good base here. And of course, the lower side, black on the left, is looking a bit thin now. So this is, this is a position where White has a bit more speed in making a living shape here, which is what AlphaGo is trying to do. Right. So it's one of those two things. Either white gets a bit more space and a quicker life on the lower side, or um, if black plays this way, white is planning to switch the right side. And if we had a look at the policy network, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, this move is one of the one of the mm, uh, moves sure. that AlphaGo was thinking about. But in the actual game, white played here. Um, this is a move. I think it, I was told by a number of players in Japan that when they saw this move, this was the game number one, right? So they saw this move and they decided they would not study AlphaGo's games. Because it was <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't. It didn't stop me. Um, at this point, well, well um, but let me. But let me just ask you. So, so the first move, you thought that you, if you had just seen that, you'd think somebody was playing around. But why was? Why did the other pros have that response to that second move? Well, just what I was saying. They, they have the feeling that uh, maybe AlphaGo is just goofing up, or if 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 there's some reason for it, it's it's something. So they feel like it's almost different. disrespectful. Well, if there's a good reason for this move, it's so difficult that we're going to have trouble figuring it out anyway. So oh, wow. basically, I'm going to I'm going to tell you why White played here. Okay. Uh, but what I say is just going to be a guess. <laughs> um, okay. Now I think that basically. All of White's uh, strategy here rotates around the idea that White wants to play this move. And so um, when playing this other attachment first, White is trying to get something just a little bit extra okay. before White plays this move. And that's how it turned out. So it worked really well for White here. Um, so just to um, talk about how I would play with Black, I would play the Hane here. Mm -hmm. And um, if White plays here, Black can connect. Um, and if white plays here, now um, white is still a bit cramped on the lower side. Like yeah. white has to add the one stone here, and black gets um, this extension, which is a pincer, is really a nice move for black. So I, I wouldn't be so happy with this for white because black also is alive on the right, on the left side. Black's alive on both sides, so it's, yeah, it's not. Yeah. Like that. Um, I'm actually thinking white might play here anyway. And this is sort of counterintuitive when white has started something on the lower side to throw them away. Okay. Um, but this actually, it works to a certain extent if we assume something like this happens. Um, mm. White's still pointed in the right direction, and those two stones, um, depending on how the game develops, they could be a bad exchange. But also, if white gets to connect on the fourth line, then sometimes um, they can be ineffective. So it depends on how the game and develops, and so they're not complete, a complete loss, I won't say. Okay. Um, actually, I have my doubts about this final move for Black. Black, Black might play a Hane on the fifth line, um, and that would just con uh, confuse things, so I'm not going to talk about that. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was, I was going to uh, keep silent about that, but yeah, I just had it. And so Black plays a Hane on this side. So this makes it easy for White. Um, I sort of like the game for White at this point, because White has played both 
forcing moves. Mm -hmm. And um, well, of course, the connection on the fourth line is not forcing now. But white does have a lot of a bit of extra potential on the left of the lower side. And so white plays the extension. So this is pretty close to what I thought AlphaGo was trying to do in the beginning with the first attachment. And of course, that attachment has been seen before in AlphaGo's games. So it's, mm -hmm. it, that was not a new move to me. It was right. something I was expecting AlphaGo to be doing again. Um, and white's got something extra on the lower left side of the lower side. So I'm, I'm happy with this. And black in, invades. This is basically next thing white does on the left on the right side is to connect at the uh, five Q point or on the on the fourth line to make a solid connection in a, in a territory there. So black invades immediately. This makes sense. And now white switches to the lower side. Um, so we have a lot of in, unfinished stuff here. So it's already looking very confusing. Um, I think the natural way for black to play would to be continuing on the lower side. Um, like this, and so we would have this kind of a, a, a fight, and a fight running into the center, and the focus of the game would switch to the left side of the board. Um, maybe it, Black didn't choose this because this would make it difficult for Black to find a good point of the game to invade the right side and start a fight there, because the fight on the left side is getting more important right now. Mm -hmm. And so another possibility would be to, um, to cut here, maybe, um, and this would just be a, a very nice position for white in the lower left. So it would be a trade, and uh, you would have this kind of fight. And I put a variation in for that, too. In the game, black invaded first. And um, this is what the Japanese players would be calling ki, um, where the fighting spirit. Right. Um, but of course, fighting spirit, um, even when humans use it, it's not just being a tough guy and refusing to answer your opponents. The fact that you're trying to control the flow of the game mm -hmm. and create an area where you have an advantage in the fighting. So it's, it's, this is the kind of um, contest that the players are in at this point. And we can see black is expanding on a large scale with this two space jump, just to make the right side more important than what is happening in the lower left at this point. Mm -hmm. So now white has to deal with that on the right side of the board. And again, Already, we're seeing a position that um, has never happened in a human game, and nothing even resembling this has ever happened. So it's a, a, new, a new thing that AlphaGo has invented, you might say. And also the fact that we're seeing the middle game starting so early mm -hmm. is very typical of AlphaGo, because AlphaGo likes to play these very short Joseki, like it plays the Kakari, and quite often it doesn't follow up with the Kakari on, in the upper right there. And then it doesn't really play any Joseki. Like, um, <clears throat> you will find later in the series that it plays, it jumps into the three three points very early in the game. Yeah, yeah. It jumps well, into me... the three points. That's the one Joseki that it really likes to play. So what's your idea about what's going on with that, with, without doing the Josekis? Um, it doesn't feel well, like that's... I think that basically AlphaGo has, seems to have a bad record with complicated Josekis. And I think uh -huh. that's just because um, human players uh, have been studying um, Joseki for, you could say, thousands of years. Um, and at least modern Joseki have been, some of them have been around for several hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a, a great uh, store of knowledge about some of the more complicated variations. And so the Avalanche Joseki and the Taisha Joseki. Uh, would be examples of that, where we just know all of the variations and we've studied them in great detail. And we still don't know the whole of the uh, all about the Joseki, but we know a lot about it that AlphaGo is, is not stored the knowledge in that fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we're more likely to find a mistake when AlphaGo makes it. And so well, it has, relatively, I think it has uh, a, a bad record against human players playing these complicated Joseki. <clears throat> this, <clears throat> I'll ask it anyway. So, you know, uh, amateurs who would rather not study Joseki, I mean, <laughs> should they? <laughs> should well, this give, is, <clears throat> that's a difficult question to ask. I, I know, I know, right? Um, and I've always uh, been of the opinion that you need a few Joseki, like you need the um, the Tsukeshiki Joseki, when your opponent, that's a Joseki that's worth learning. 
Um, you don't really need a lot of Joseki. You need a Joseki to cope with the star point. So you need to have an idea of what you want to do against the star point. Okay. A few Joseki, which are, don't have to be very long, are, are good enough for most amateur players, especially Q players. And if you try to learn complicated Joseki like the Naudare, that, that's a Joseki, uh, the Avalanche Joseki is difficult for pros. And so you read a book and you can memorize everything in the book and you still don't know everything about the Avalanche Joseki. So um, that's a Joseki that actually I would not recommend for an amateur player to, to study. And actually some professionals say they don't bother with the Avalanche Joseki. And of course, right. um, AlphaGo doesn't bother with it anymore either. Um, <laughs> and I would be willing to assume that in most, in, in almost all of the games it plays, we haven't seen very many of the games. We, it's just, this is just a very small set, but I think most of the time it's going to be in avoiding the Avalanche Joseki. Okay. Um, and it, it just, just like, this is in the background, the background of this is that AlphaGo is playing against humans that usually, um, after something like 30 moves, it usually has a very good winning percentage already. Right. Like it could be going up to something like 70%. So uh, I so don't know. Yeah. yeah. So, it so it's like just a... playing a difficult Joseki and staying somewhere around 50% is probably a failure. For gotcha. Me. Yeah. All and right. So, so White Place's attachment. This is another amazing move. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of wondering uh, why Black doesn't play the honey here. Mm. This, this seems a very strong, the strongest local response. Mm -hmm. And AlphaGo is a very strong fighter. So I don't really know why uh, Black did. This is one question that I would ask AlphaGo, but it's actually more fun to, to, to try to figure it out on my own. Like this variation, it, this is uh, just locally, it's not very good for White. It's a bit, um, White's in a bit of trouble here. So maybe White's going to pull back uh, like this. But then of course, this, would, this is a bit heavy too. So I don't really know what White's gonna do. Um, so this is a question I have. This is where I would play with black. Um, playing the honey on the top is another strong move locally. Uh, but in this case, white can uh, have A and B here. So white has um, pretty good shape in this case. It, it mm. just works better for white. Um, in the game, black pulled back. This looks a bit weak for me. And this is a very nice move. And with this move, white has already sort of settled the right side. Uh, because if black plays a honey here, uh, white can just uh, play this way, um, and it's more or less connected. If black pushes through and cuts, the, the fight will be a fight that favors white, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so white has the advantage here. Black pulls back again. This is this looks like a good move, actually. Um, and white pushes, white's again trying to connect to the right side. And we have this, uh, this double hane. Um, this looks okay. And then this move, like I would expect white just to play here. Yeah. Um, and actually on the right side, of course, white can jump into the 3-3 three, three point with B. Um, it is showing, right? Yeah. And uh, then there's C. Um, the attachment of C, white can make some trouble on the right side. So the right side, although it looks big, it's, it's going to be hard for black to make that 100% black's territory. Um, if we look at the lower side, that um, area in which white is attacking the black stone at A is pretty big now. Yeah. Um, and so I think that would be the biggest focus of the game. And it's going to be really difficult for black to escape with that one stone. Mm -hmm. So I would play this way with white. White peeps here. I don't see how this move is good, even if black just connects, because um, it gets rid of that attachment at C that I was talking about. Uh, yeah. Peeping here and exchanging with the connection would actually make white a bit more heavy uh, and black extends in the center. Well, so would you call that, that peep a mistake? Um, at the very least, I would say I don't understand it. Um, and I think that when I look at this position, I want to play with white. Right. And when I look at this position, um, when I looked at it closely, I'm starting to want to play with black now. So the game okay. is starting to be good for black. So that's, um, that's my assessment. White has played some moves on the right side, but we can see that this right side it's not going to be a big white territory because the, the side is open. Um, and black now is going to be able to take the offensive on the lower side. And so now the white group on the lower side is becoming weak. Right. And AlphaGo just loves to play Tanuki. It plays away when stuff is happening. And so you, you see a group that is, is supposed to be strong. And then a few moves that turns into a weak group like this. 
And so AlphaGo doesn't really, it's judgment of thickness is different than a lot of players. Like if you see a wall, usually you think it's going to be thickness. Uh, almost always you can count on the fact that AlphaGo is not looking at that wall as thickness. Um, it, it's, it, its idea of thickness is a, a group with two eyes. Right. A group with two eyes is a strong group. And I sort of agree with that. That's, that's the Chodskun analysis of what thickness is. And I've always believed that um, mm -hmm. since I heard him say it. It's um, pretty good evidence, right? Yeah. And I'm sort of leaning towards the, the, the capping move here, um, which is a more direct attack against black. Um, mm. White pushes here. This is white sort of preparing once. White is threatening to connect up in the center. And, and next white will play a kind of a capping move. So white's trying to make it more effective. Um, if black plays here, white just connects in the center. This would make mm -hmm. it easy for white. Mm -hmm. um, this is the kind of thing you would expect black to do, because this is an area where white seems to have more strength. So I was sort of surprised by this move. Uh, black is attacking here. And so this really took me by surprise. Um, if white plays the safe move, actually, this is going to be better for black. So this is the safe move that white can play. This is a kind of a joseki we have here. Nice shape. Um, yeah. <laughs> And black can play the Hanetsugi here. Um, uh, the value of this uh, empty triangle here is that it reduces the value of the cut. Right. And so it makes it easier for white to deal with the cut. Um, but it, it does become a kind of an extra clunky shape uh, when white uh, has to surround the corner. And so black will continue here and we'll be able to force white to put some extra stones in the corner. And this is actually a very nice shape for black on the lower side. Black has moved out and it's not a weak group anymore. And so this is better than what I was showing you before where black had just jumped out. Black has a nice shape here. And so this is, this is what black is sort of planning to do. Uh, but what black actually did, what actually happened is white uh, played the honey here, which is not the safe move. This is the safe move. Um, but in this case, it would be better for black compared to this kind of thing. And so white plays strongly here. And black cuts, and then white plays here. Now, uh, in this case, there's a lot, lot, lot more uncertainty, uncertainty as, as to what's going to happen on the right, um, what's going to happen with this fight here, because both of white's groups are weak too. And black is not yet alive in the corner. Um, so everything is dead at this point. And, um, it's really interesting. What AlphaGo does in a position like this is it plays away. And let me just jump in for a sec. So, so this is how many moves in? This is something like 50 moves into the game. So 50 moves into the game. And what's your sort of, I mean, you just sort of did a quick uh, snap judgment, but I mean, it's all over the place, right? I mean, you know, and, and normally the AlphaGo human, you know, AlphaGo would be pretty much, you know, starting to wrap up the game, right? I mean, right, you know, yeah. But this is not happening here. Yeah, well, what's happening on the right side, let's just uh, push that forward a few moves. Black is just trying to get a kind of a squeeze here on the right side. Sure, this is sure. going to be white's territory. White has about 10 points of territory there. Black okay. has about 20 points in the lower, lower right. Okay. And then the rest of the board is just uncertain. Um, Black's group in the center is, is okay for the time being, but you never know what's going to happen to that group. Uh, and then there's this completely... Um, difficult, very difficult fight happening in the lower left. Right. And so the game is sort of uh, focused on that one fight. Uh, but black does have a slight lead in territory. And so it's just completely uncertain. I, I would say the game is even at this point. Um, as the game develops, I'm beginning to think that actually maybe it's good for black at this point. But okay. um, I, would, I would not recognize this um, just looking at this position. Mm -hmm. When I say it, it's actually better for black, it's just the fact that I've um, seen what happens now. <laughs> uh, in the lower left corner, now black has a choice of pushing to the left or pushing to the right. So that one of those would be pushing to the right like this, sure. or covering on the right side. Um, in which case, white would, um, this would kill the corner. So the, the drawback of this move is, is that it induces white to kill the corner. Right. Um, and black can push here. And then the question is, can black um, surround white from the right to force a semi -at. And the answer is no. So this is a failure for black, because if black covers here, then white can cut, and black loses the key, the vital four stones in this. So, so this is just 
a complete collapse for black. And we can see that white has a good position on the, right, on the left side, too. So black could not do that. So the game move is the correct one. So this is where black played. This is the better move. Um, actually, I think white probably should have extended here. And we can expand, expect something like this happening. And white can just barely connect underneath here. It's a very bad shape. Um, but uh, black needs to put a stone in the center once before black can make a, a semi-axe. So black needs this move. And white can win the, the race to capture. So this left, lower left corner is going to be about 10 points of white territory. Uh, black will probably then jump into the three, three point, uh, something like this. Um, this actually looks like it's pretty close. So I think this mm -hmm. is an even result. And I like it better for white than what happened in the actual game. So yeah. And again, I, I've made this uh, SDF file with all of the variations in it. So people can go back and look at the SDF file too. And so white pushes through here. This is the, the greediest move. White is just taking the lower side, but white has not actually finished off the corner yet. The corner still has potential to live. Um, and the, the time that AlphaGo plays these forcing moves, like these on the right side, is, is really interesting because it might be actually giving it some itself some extra time to think. Um, but also, when when opponent plays a forcing move, sometimes AlphaGo will just play a forcing move elsewhere. Um, and so it just doesn't want to uh, let the opponent push it around. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's sort of something that looks almost looks human there, the yeah. way it plays forcing moves sometimes. I was when I was going through the game, I felt the same way. I felt like it, it felt almost human in that, yeah, you're going to do this, then I'm going to do this. Yeah. And it happens over and over. And there's some cases where there's uh, you can actually find a reason for it to be doing that, a logical reason. But then there's sometimes when I, I'm thinking that maybe it's just sort of um, refusing to be pushed around, is what I would say, yeah. So here we see that because white is pushed through on the fifth line here on the lower side, uh, white has a bigger territory on the lower side, but black is able to push white down on the second line. and. Uh, this is not really good for white, but locally, of course, it's a position that's bad for white. Um, actually, you see AlphaGo crawling on the second line a lot. Um, it, it did that in the Master Series, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but in this case, it's not so good for white. And this is a kind of a branching point of the game at this point, because white has um, crawled long enough to be able to kill the lower left corner. And so this is a time where I would be thinking of living. I was just uh, going to ask you about that. Yeah, it yeah. just seems so big. Because of the cut on the second line, white has to answer this. And so black will be able to live in the corner. So right. this is a huge move. Um, and then, of course, after this, white, black would be able to continue on the third line on the left side. So white would probably play here. And then black plays here. And black has this huge move <clears throat> next at A. Um, I would feel pretty happy with black at this point. I think black has a lead. Um, actually, in the game, I think maybe Black has a lead too. This is a really big point too. It's a very, it's a very influential point on the upper side, and so I would have trouble judging um, whether this move is bigger or the lower left corner is bigger. Um, but I would feel safer playing in the lower left corner. It just right. simplifies the game a little bit, and so White finishes off the corner. And at this point, in a human game, you would think that the game would be sort of settling down a bit, as we have the white territory in the lower left area established now. And it's just a question of black uh, surroundings and territory on the upper, upper side. Sure. So you would think the game is going to simplify, but it doesn't. Uh, so black plays there. This is very natural. Black is cutting off the cornerstone. Uh, white moves out once. And then now white's alive. So this is another branching point at which I would play here. Um, and this is basically what I'm thinking is I'm thinking that maybe black has a slight lead. And so I'm, I'm trying to find moves that are relatively simple. And so I'd be interested to see what actually AlphaGo says. At some point, they'll probably publish um, the percentages or something. Um, and we'll see if actually if AlphaGo agrees with me or actually not, because the problem is almost there's a, a huge percentage of these games are going to be the smallest possible margin. Like mm -hmm. if you, they're all using the Chinese rules, mm -hmm. but if you were thinking about it in Japanese rules, they would be half point games or sometimes right. one and a half points. 
Right. And so there's this multitude of games um, that are very, very close. And I think that AlphaGo is very quick to be able to judge uh, judge the the result. And okay. so it's actually calling these half point games, which are very difficult for like a human player could maybe figure it out in the last 50, 70 moves. But we're still at a point in the game where there's uh, something like 200 moves left in the game. Um, and I think that actually AlphaGo has very good positional judgment and it can it maybe has a better idea than I do of who's winning at this point. But I have the feeling that Black is winning. Um, but this move, is, Black is trying to get, get a bit extra. And so the fact that Black is trying to get a little bit extra here uh, makes me wonder if I'm right. Uh, because Black is trying to play a forcing move against White's corner here uh, before surrounding the upper side. It's not as if White is going to die in the upper left corner, but Black is trying to squeeze the upper left corner a little bit more before Black starts surrounding the upper side. So Black's trying to get something extra. So you're, you're thinking that maybe the judgment is actually that Black feels it's it's, uh, it's a little behind or, or that maybe it's closer than it wants? Well, it's very close. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the, with all this open space, I can't really judge it for myself, but I wouldn't be surprised if the game is going back and forth um, and a human would say it was going back and forth on a, at a half point. Um, and of course, AlphaGo doesn't think in half points, it thinks in percentages. Right. So the, the, it would be going back in, uh, in the area of 50% back and forth. Mm. And, and I, I have the feeling that it's, very, it's pretty close. Like even if I um, played here and won with black, it would be something like, um, and it's a seven and a half point komi if you talk in Japanese way. So it's, um, it's a big komi. Maybe black would just win by half a point, one and a half points or two and a half points, something like that. Um, so it's reasonable that Black is trying to get a bit more, maybe. And I don't really know exactly how far ahead Black is, but it's, it's going to be a relatively small difference. Mm. And now also White is not satisfied to play. Like um, playing here would be the safe move. White would easily live in the corner. Um, if Black continues here, White has a living shape. So it's, it's no problem for White to play this way. But of course, this would give Black, Black would probably not play that um, extra move, but just this one exchange here, it makes a difference for Black. It, it, um, it makes this move less effective. And so um, it's a big difference for, uh, uh, an advantage for Black to have that one exchange in there. And so White plays here. So both of the players are playing as if, um, as if they think that it's not, it's a position which is maybe in the balance. Right. Um, I still think it looks good for black, um, but it's, it's definitely not as settled as that variation where I uh, was living in the lower left corner. Mm -hmm. um, so now white is not completely alive. Any attempt to live in the, in the corner was gonna be painful at, at least. So white moves out into the center. Um, white plays a hunting here. Of course, black cannot cut because if black cuts, white can peep here and capture the stone. So this would be bad. So black plays a hunting. Um, so we have this fight developing in the center. Obviously, with all these black stones in the area, it's going to be tough for white. Um, but then white counterattacks. And, you know, this sort of takes me by surprise because if we compare the left side black group to white's group in the corner, actually black's group is stronger, um, partly because it's going to take a lot of doing for white just to cut it off. And also there's the fact that um, if Black plays first on the left side, Black's going to win the semi -act. It's just It's just something that I, I sort of know uh, from experience, that Black's going to win the semi mm -hmm. And so I'm surprised why White playing so strongly here. But as the game develops, um, we see some White territory developing on the lower side. So White's actually getting a local profit from this exchange. Yeah, uh, cool. And this White group looks like it could even be dead. Yeah. Um, it, obviously, if there's going to be a fight to capture, if there's going to be a semi, then Black's going to win it. Yeah. And so this was like the one of the high points of the game for me. This attachment That's here. So exciting. Yeah. Because like if White does not play the attachment and plays a more normal move like this, it's going to be fairly difficult for White to make a living shape. It's it's going to be a bit more painful. Um, but with this exchange. Um, white has two directions, like if black plays here, now white's going to play here, 
and white has a slightly better position because of the, because to cut white off on the left side, black has to play here anyway. Um, if white plays at that point, white would be able to connect on the second line. So when this happens, white gets a little bit extra in the center. And it's very easy for white to make a living shape with minimal loss. And so this, this is a success for white. White has two eyes, A and B or Mi. And black has not captured the five white stones in the center. And so black is going to capture five stones there. So locally, black's going to get a profit. Um, but the point is, white has uh, played a move, an extra move on the upper side. And also, white has gained some territory on the lower side. So white is getting uh, peripheral profit, while black gets profit in the immediate fight. So this is very well played by white. So let's go back to the position where wow. white's played attachment. Um, yeah. So this is an amazing move. And so naturally, black pushes through. Uh, but now, um, I don't really understand this attachment, and I don't understand why black did not play on the left. Um, there is a bit of a difference in how the center will continue, but I think it might be better for black to play on the left. So this is an exchange that I I haven't really found an explanation for. Yeah, I wondered the same thing. The only, the only thing is that <clears throat> they, they do have a beautiful symmetry, the, uh, the attachments on both sides. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just, and then, this, well, this is attachment underneath. This yeah. is the, the vital point. Uh, this is the key move because black cannot, just because of that move on the fourth line that white played here, uh, this move, now it works. So so that this exchange here was actually asking what black, if black is going to connect on the left. If black connects on the left, white can do this. Is mm -hmm. black going to connect on the right? If black connects on the right, um, white's going to do this. Right. And with this, white can connect on the, we'll see that happen. Um, this is really amazing. This looks so weird, and it works. Because if black pushes through, then yeah. It looks, it's, the shape looks so strange, but it's actually working. And you it's can amazing. see this. Yeah. Black also has to worry about that cut in the center on the fifth line. Mm -hmm. And so black cannot play very strongly here. So white can connect on the second line. And instead of playing this way, black very chose to, just to connect, um, getting some extra points in the center. And also um, playing these forcing moves from the corner is a profit for black. So black chose mm -hmm. this course. And took the five stones. So locally, black has gained something like 20 points here. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that white is going to be connecting on the first line. So white is, white's territory there is pretty non-existent. Um, but meanwhile, white has gained something on the lower side and is now going to play this move on the upper side. Right, right. And so um, although black is being attacking throughout this whole fight, the end result is pretty even. And it's amazing how the game is in the balance after all this fighting. And um, I think it's going to be, at this point, I'm thinking it's going to be a half point difference. Wow. Um, and look, it's only 125 games into the game, uh, moves into the game. Right, right, right. Like, it, there's going to be at least 100 moves. And so there's no way I can really get a correct end game <laughs> at this point. I, I, I could not, I, I have not, do not have confidence that I could correctly play the end game or even set up a correct end game. It would take a lot of work and I, I could get it wrong anyway. Um, but I think already AlphaGo um, has a pretty good idea of what it's going to do. And um, as far as I can tell, the game is in the balance throughout the rest of the end game. It's like a knife's edge. I mean, I mean, I mean, not, yeah. not, even up until now has been mm -hmm. the same. As you pointed out, I think 20, 25 mm -hmm. moves ago, uh, you know, it was a point at which you would normally start to see things wrap up, and instead all hell sort of breaks loose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Right, yeah. And that's still going to happen. So, um, this is actually one of the simpler games. Um, and <laughs> now... Buckle your seatbelt, so it's going <laughs> to be a bumpy ride. Yeah. And... I still sort of have the idea that blacks should be able to win, but it could be a, a um, it could have been a preconception because I had a lot of trouble finding a variation in which that actually happens. Interesting. Um, and also, I was talking about how uh, AlphaGo backs up in the end game. Mm -hmm. um, I still suspect it could be happening, um, but as I was yeah. saying, it's it's so complicated that um, I'm really having a lot of trouble finding any moves to point to. When you say backs up, you mean you mean uh, doesn't necessarily play the most optimal when it's move. winning anyway. Right. When it's winning anyway, um, I think that it plays moves that reduce the winning margin, 
Right. Um, and in some of the games, I might actually be showing you moves like that. Okay. Um, but there, in the final stages of the game, uh, a human professional is very good at, um, can actually play a perfect end game, almost mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. um, like if we're t talking just about the final 50 moves. And so that's a point in the game where I was actually seeing that happen in the Master Series. Um, and I could actually point to um, actual moves. Sure. But in this case, it's probably happening earlier, and I, I, I can point to moves that I think are slack maybe, but um, it's very difficult at early parts of the game for me to say that this move is losing one point or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's just it's um, too much. It's too complicated sometimes to say. And so black extends. This is a nice move. Black is um, with the kosumi on the on the second line there. That uh, it looks a bit of a loose shape, but actually black has a living position already. So this is nice. Um, and white plays the attachment. Um, I have the feeling that black should probably just play here. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But when I actually worked this end game out, it looked like it was going to be another half point game. Like um, white's probably going to play here and then just cover. Um, and black's corner is, is well, it's a lie. Um, uh, white's probably going to play some forcing moves like this, um, something like this. Some, some. Uh, this is what I would play if I was um, playing for both of the players, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I tried to work out the end game, but like it's, it's still it's pretty close to 100 moves, and so it's a very difficult end game for me to finish. So mm -hmm. I just sort of gave, I, I I left it here. Um, I didn't leave it there, but I, I just sort of discarded all of my attempts. <laughs> so I'm going back to the game now. Okay. This discretion was... discretion is a better part of valor sometimes, Michael. Yeah. Um, and so now this is really sharp for white. White uh, is switching to the upper side. And now this move that white played I, earlier in the yeah. game is coming in. This is, this is really hitting a weak point in black state. Like if white plays a hane underneath on the second line, then the corner uh, group is going to die. So black has to um, be careful. Black has to keep on answering here. So white sort of gets the momentum to live on the upper side. So white scooped out the whole upper side here. It looks like it's a, a great victory for white locally. Yeah. But actually, um, it turns out that Black has gained a little bit in the center and in the upper right corner. And um, it still seems to be a very close game. And so I guess that it was just an even trade. And That's why this serious is serious calculating. Um, it's really very, very difficult to evaluate these games. We're still at move 150, and there's still more than 100 moves left in the game. Mm. And AlphaGo actually plays a lot of codes towards the end. So. Um, like the people at DeepMind were saying, that um, after uh, Lee Sedol played that amazing move in game four of that series, um, they decided that AlphaGo had to be um, trained in a way, you might say, um, to be able to handle complicated positions like that. Mm. And so Fang Hui um, came up with these middle game problems, whole board problems, which were extreme, extremely complicated. And he would feed these problems to AlphaGo and have AlphaGo solve them. And of course, the Lee Settle game four was one of those problems, mm -hmm. but um, similar, very complicated problems. And um, by doing that, uh, it actually gave uh, AlphaGo a kind of a set of um, data for these complicated games, which gave it, um, gave it I guess it gave the value net and the profile net, uh, I'm pausing that, I, I, networks. Um, some biases that could handle these complicated positions. Mm. And so that's the story that the AlphaGo, the, uh, the DeepMind people were telling um, in China. And I think they maybe actually have overdone it because now AlphaGo just loves these complicated positions and it sort of just goes into them. And mm. it, sometimes it seems to be making the game more complicated than it needs to. Just and it because. Seems to sort of, just because it ha it's ha has all this training um, and so it has this fairly large data set full of complicated games. And maybe it's sort of thinking that um, these games that would be sort of bewildering, very difficult for humans to understand, um, maybe it's thinking that they're more normal than the, ah, the I see what you mean. Yeah. It has so many games to study with. And so it's, um, it's changed Alphago's style, you might say. 
Mm -hmm. And there's also the fact that the games are so close makes it, it's trying to do better. It, it's not trying to simplify the game anymore. So that could be part of it. Mm. And so Black is trying to make some trouble in the lower left corner here. And um, actually this, this filling the dominant here, it, it makes a big difference in Black's territory because uh, White could push through at the same point. Let's just put that one in. Um, Uh, white can push through here and reduce Black's territory. So there's, there's some liability that Black has there. And so um, Black's protecting against that while threatening White in the center. So White's um, being very, sort of being forced to be on the defensive here uh, in the lower side, just to make sure that's White territory. And that's what's happening with the peep here also. This is really funny because you would think that Black is um, threatening to cut on the third line. Right. But that, yes. that's not the threat at all. Uh, like if white answers there, this is going to be a collapse for white actually, um, because uh, black is aiming at the cut in the center here. Like if uh, if white answers. Oh, oh yes, here. right, right, right. I, and yeah. um, okay, let's just add another variation. I get mm. carried away. Um, like if no, black no, does no, that. We... If black does that immediately, it's not going to work because white can answer filling the liberty here. Sure. So black needs this extra stone here to make right. that difference. Um, and so uh, now if white plays here, black's going to be able to cut. So this mm -hmm. is a collapse for white. So white maybe plays, has to fill a liberty. But now you can see that stone on the right there, that peep stone that black played, is going to make a difference. Because now white's group on the left is um, in danger, and black can cover here. And this is threatening to live on the left side, in the, in the corner. So white tries to kill that, black and force with this move. And so white takes and black lives. This is a live shape. Otherwise, if, black, if white tries to kill it, uh, now we get this call here. And so just the fact that black could play that Atari on the second line at G2, um, it allowed black to get this call. So this is amazing. It's something that even a professional like myself, uh, it doesn't spring to mind immediately. Uh, yeah. But this is what uh, what AlphaGo was threatening um, with with the peep. Oh, sorry, I I jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, this peep here was threatening all of that stuff that's going to happen in the corner. Amazing. And so white plays here. This looks like a very cautious <laughs> move, but I know. Uh, it's actually correct because white needs to correct, connect all the stones up just to get rid of that bad algae in the corner. So white's just connecting up, right. and the peep doesn't really accomplish anything directly because white's connected underneath. Yeah, yeah. And so the, what Black did accomplish with the peep on the third line was that Black sort of forced White to play some extra stones inside White's territory, but um, did not accomplish anything more effective. And so this is a huge move. Um, yeah. And this is a point of the game uh, where I still have a lot of trouble counting it. I think we're still, it still could be about 100 moves. Like um, there's this area in the center, which is uh, a lot of white stones that look like they could be captured, but it's not so easy to capture them actually. And there's this end game sequence on the right side. Uh, there's some potential for black to put white in uh, Damizmar or lack of liberties on the left side of the board. And there's the upper right yeah. corner. Uh, the upper right corner is a, an area of, um, there's a lot of fluidity in that area. Like if, if black plays here, uh, a and B are me I. Um, and this is another end game that I just didn't go on to the end. Like I, with 50 games, and this being one of the relatively simple ones, I don't really feel like um, like studying this end game would take weeks for me. I think. Sure. I'm just leaving it here. I think that this is actually, if Black had an a, a opportunity to win this game at this point, this is maybe Black's last chance. Uh -huh, um, so this, uh -huh. this is the variation where um, I would look into to say maybe Black can win the game, um, but it's going to be another very close game. Mm -hmm. um, because after this, um, I have trouble finding any win winning variations, anything that looks promising to me for Black. But again, as I say, it's going to be a very small margin. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very difficult. This is a big move. Um, so that's why I'm saying that Black should have played there. It's a, it's a huge move for White, too. Um, and white plays this here. Um, white's trying to make a bit of Aji in the center, like if black just connects, uh, then uh, white can force with this connection. 
this this connection threatens to, like if black plays here, uh, white can play here to capture the black or black center stones. So um, black has to answer that. That gives white a little bit extra safety, in, in that center area of the, of the board. Um, so it's uh, good for white. Uh, are you see, still seeing this, uh, Chris? Yeah. So no, I've, I've been following this, but what's been fascinating to me is how you know this is the kind of game we just did not see. Uh, in our previous series, where it was AlphaGo against humans, where the games were over fairly quickly, um, and and here's a game where what I think you said were 150 moves into this game, and you know it's a bit more now, yeah, yeah. Well, like, it's, it's, um, as far as I can tell, the game is sort of in the balance um, still, almost all the time, like um, from very early stages. Like I, I wouldn't be saying that Black was 10, more than 10 points ahead on the board. At any point, and like it's it's sort of going back and forth, maybe um, with very small margins, and so it's a very well balanced game, and and that's what makes it so complicated because both players have to play to get the most out of their stones, like they can't simplify the game. Right. Yeah. And so that's right. the big difference between this and the Master series, where um, AlphaGo was far enough ahead that it could simplify the game. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really, I mean, it's just a thrilling, thrilling game. And, and as you mentioned, this is one of the simpler ones, which is sort of mind-boggling. Yeah. This, this is and not a simple game. Yeah. Well, it's really exciting up to the very end here. And the end game is exciting, too. So that's why I'm going so far much further in the game. <clears throat> um, again, why it's trying to create some extra Ozzy and Sign Black's territory. Right. Um, but this this move in the upper right corner is a huge move. Like this is the last big end game move, and so that's that's why I was sort of thinking maybe Black should have taken that. <clears throat> a black connects in the center. Now this is putting white uh, white's whole center group there. Uh, all those white stones in the center are, are being put, put put under pressure. But white cuts once here. Again, white's trying to create some extra uh, possibilities in the center. Like if black connects here. Um, well, actually, Black did. Let's, let's just look at the game. Black pushed through once and then connected. Um, we, again, we see Black playing a forcing move that's not near, really necessary. And White connects here. Now, next, White can kill the center, right? Because if Black plays elsewhere, uh, White can just play like this to, to capture Black stones right. in the center. Right. So right. that's the threat there. Um, and Black answers that by connecting here. Momentarily, that, that takes away the threat, but again, white can connect here. And now there's a different threat, because if black plays away, um, <laughs> white can uh, kill black on this side. And mm. so there's all these, all these little uh, semantical problems that we have to solve as the game continues. Um, so black answers here. And we can see also that black is, by filling white's liberties on the left side of the board, black's going to get a bit extra there later on. Mm -hmm. So black has also played the best best sequence here. Um, and here we, uh, yeah, this center sequence is forced. And this is forcing because if white plays away, mm -hmm. again, we have to read the semi out here. This is actually just uh, very bad news for white, whatever happens, because if white yeah. tries to save that tail, then white's going to lose the semi. And so this is just, it's going to be a lot of moves white has to put into his territory, and white's going to lose the tail. So this, this is a variation that white cannot afford to have happen. So white answers here. <clears throat> so that's something that black got out of the last, um, you might call it a fight that was happening in the center. Mm -hmm. Because now, because white's in Damasumari, now white had to answer that. Um, and now this is the final big end game. Right. And so now the game is relatively simple. And I could work it out to find that every time white wins by one fourth of a stone. Um, <laughs> and and this is actually it can be half a point or one and a half points in the Japanese rules, but all of these games are played in the Chinese rules, so it's always a hundred uh, fourth of a point. Um, and I've thought up an explanation of, of uh, the way that the numbers are different for Chinese and Japanese rules, and it, it might be a good way to explain it is to say that um, if you take a position where black has fifty one percent and white has 49% of the board, the Japanese rules would want to say that black wins by 2% because sure. um, 
it's a 2% difference. Sure. Whereas what the Chinese rules are doing when they count the game is they were saying that 51% is 1% more than half of the board. So black has a score of 1%. And for white, if you counted the white side, then the Chinese rules would say that white has a deficit of 1% and because it's 49%. And so the Chinese rules are comparing it to one half of the board. And because of that, you're getting a number that is usually one half of what you get with the Japanese rules. Um, okay. So I thought that might be a nice explanation. Okay, but so there's a lot of folks out there that are really interested in the rules, and, and that that's a good explanation. So well, um, it almost never changes the the result, right. the win loss right. result. But there is a the fact that um, you're doing that and you're getting half size numbers. It means that the Chinese number encompasses two results for black, mm -hmm. uh, for the Japanese rules that is. And so right. um, so you you sometimes get an even number or an odd number for the Japanese rules. Um, but it's always going to be just one one number for the Chinese rules, right? Which is which is why somebody per, some some people prefer the Chinese rules. It's, it's uh... there's some logic there. It's, it's um, the reason they only count one side is because it's a bit cumbersome to count. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and this I, I just want to show you what this uh, throw in here. This move looks a bit strange, right? It does. It's, it's actually there's a real threat here because. Uh, white can squeeze here and, and get a, a sicky like shape, and it means that black will have to throw away those first stones. Oh. And this is big. Uh, and the reason white plays this to, to begin with is because um, if white does not play it, uh, then black has the option of, um, of playing here and here later, and this would eventually force white to put a stone inside white's territory. So this right. would be a, a fairly large move which is not forcing yet, unfortunately, for black. But pretty soon it's going to be a forcing move. And so um, white is playing this to stop black from doing that. And and now, of course, white, black cannot push through um, because black's in Dama Zimari. So it's, it's not, so white can eventually force there. And here we see white, white's playing the forcing move. Uh, it's sort of typical of AlphaGo to choose this time to play this forcing move. Obviously. Black has played a forcing move, but the white forcing move is bigger. Right. So it's okay to do it. And it's a it's a point that white wants to play at some at some time to stop black from playing that Atari. Um, so there's a point where that Atari will be a significantly big move for black to play. Absolutely. Um, so there's a reason for white to play this. There's no reason for white to be playing it at such a tricky time. Um, but it work it happens to work. And then black plays the forcing move too. So this is where the end game gets really exciting for me, because I have to work out what happens if white plays this. Yes, right? yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, couldn't, I could not work it out. And I sort of teased people with this SDF file because I stopped, I stopped my um, variation at, in the middle. I, I went pretty far, didn't I? You did, you did. Uh, and this is uh, one fourth of a stone for white. <laughs> so it's the same result, um, no difference. Um, and, and I think people, if, if they're really interested, they could probably work out the rest of the end game. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, go, but yeah, go, for, not, go if, for it, folks. Go for it. If you're not that interested, you can just believe me. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's one fourth difference. And then finally, Black puts the answers that, and then White answers this. So it's it's like they're uh, having fun pushing each other around. I know. Yeah. A little game of chicken. Also, also, the timing of this move. Also, it, it, White could have played the cover on the second line on the upper side mm -hmm. first. But of course, this is threatening to capture all of black stones in the center. So black has to answer it. <clears throat> um, and so now we're running out of endgame moves. Uh, white pushes, this is important. And then white plays there. So now the game is more or less finished. Um, actually, in the Japanese rules, um, the way that AlphaGo played this move is not the optimal move. Um, mm. And I, I put in a variation where the Japanese rules would say that white wins by one half point. But of course, it's, it's, it's going to be a one-fourth of a stone in either case. So there's no difference in the Chinese rules. And actually, sometimes you have to play a different way in the Chinese rules because the final call is, is sometimes pretty important. And so they, there's a, a, some slight differences in the way that the people play the end game in Chinese rules and Japanese rules. So, so there's some differences there. And so now we're wrapping up the game. Um, and it's interesting because AlphaGo never finishes these games. Like, it, it, there's still a few points to play. Um, I've marked a point on the first line 
on the lower side. Um, I'm saying that Black played this this strange move on the first line here, which looks yeah. like it, it loses a point. But actually, it's creating this forcing move on the first line. So it's it's, it's as if Black had played a. Um, oh, I see. It's, 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 a, yes. it's a two point. It's a um, what they call a two point end game move. It's, it's right. the same size. Right. Or a one point forcing move. Uh, and so it, it actually doesn't lose any points. And so at this point, we have some points left. There's some some end game moves on the right side of the board, and there's this this move I've marked on the lower side, and then there's a Hanetsugi on the upper side. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be very easy to finish the end game. Um, but if I if I edit the the end game now, I would probably be changing the game sequence. So I won't do that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but it's going to be a one fourth stone win for white. And so this is where Black resigned. It's amazing. It's just, just so, and, and just in that, uh, what you were just showing us there, uh, that that last little flutter, you know, where they, you know, threaten yes, on this yeah. side, I'll threaten on this side, and I'm looking, I'm thinking, oh yeah, so that stuff. Yeah, you got to calculate this and try and figure out. So thank you for doing that for for. Uh, oh yeah, for it was a lot of work. It was it was fun though, um, <laughs> and the uh, the way AlphaGo does that. Uh, and was doing stuff like that even in the Master Series when it was winning anyway. Hmm. Um, it's sort of confusing because it doesn't seem to be simplifying the game. It, yeah. it actually seems, to me, it seems to be complicating the game. That's so the feeling great. that I got, too. It, it certainly makes my job a lot more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but more fun for us, so yeah. we appreciate it. Uh, just a couple of quick questions um, before we wrap up. I mean, you've been studying these games. You've also been teaching. I assume that you've been playing as well. Or were, I mean, I guess my question is, how how are you seeing this affecting either your play or your teaching or just the way you're thinking about Go? And, and we can talk more about that, that next time too, but I just want to get your thoughts. Well, I, I think still at this point, it's the Master Series that's having a big effect on the way I play my opening. Okay. Um, and I'm just getting I'm getting to the point where I think maybe I've digested these games to the point like I've I've been looking at about 50 games and I have gotten to a certain point of understanding for maybe the first 20 to 30. Mm -hmm. um, but I still have a lot of work before I really understand them completely. Mm -hmm. And um, as I was saying, the opening is the first moves of the game are relatively simple, mm. although they are different. Like it, right. AlphaGo has just sort of invented its a whole new opening theory, it's, it's, and it doesn't have complicated Josic in it. And so there's very little that is. Um, it's, it's just the three three point invasions that come so early, which are different, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and those are things that I am seeing a lot of professionals trying out. But um, apart from that, it's the middle game, as you have seen, which is yeah. um, really really yeah. strong and very exciting. Um, and that's something that's a bit more difficult to, to mimic, of course, because it's happening so far later in the game. Um, so it's not having so much of an, a direct effect on my game, but I'm seeing a lot of flexibility and um, very strong fighting, which is probably going to change the way I play from now on. Very, very cool. Well, it's a very, uh, I think, auspicious beginning for the new series. So I think uh, it's very exciting, and I'll be interested to see, of course, a viewer's response. Uh, but I'm also just thrilled to, to see more of these games play out. Uh, as, as you say, they're, they're going to be even more exciting and, and more complicated. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'll be saying this a lot, but thank you for doing all this heavy lifting, because this is... Uh, these are really tough, but but just I'm tremendous. A lot of fun. Good. Well, we are too. So, all right. So, thank you, Michael. Thanks everybody for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.